proud. It's a great place, and what a wonderful spirit that's here. Well, as Andy mentioned, uh, my name is Noel Castellanos. I've been on the board of CCDA for many years and been involved in uh, urban ministry, particularly in the Latino community, for a lot of years. And this morning, I'd like to share a message entitled, Making Great Salsa in the Hood, okay? Making Great Salsa in the Hood. Now, at least some of you are going to wake up to find out what the heck I'm talking about. Isn't that right? Okay, and uh, as I do that, I, Andy did a great job of introducing me this morning, but I'm reminded of a time I was in Michigan, and I was getting ready to speak, and there was a woman that was introducing me, and she was very nervous about making sure that she got both my name right, Noel Castellanos, Noel Castellanos, and then that I'm the pastor, at that time I was the pastor of La Viita Community Church, and so she was kind of practicing, does this sound okay? I said, yeah, sounds great, and she gets up there and she says, I want to introduce to you the speaker for today, Noel Castellanos, and I said, man, that was perfect, and then she kind of took a deep breath, and, and he says, uh, he is the pastor of La Viita Community Church, perfect but then she went on and and she was going to say you know what and he has a passion to reach the barrios of our nation and she says and noel has a passion to reach the burritos of our nation <laughs> i was a little self-conscious to stand up after that because she looked at me I, I guess and she said man this guy has reached a lot of burritos in his time you know but uh, this morning, I, I want to talk to you about this topic, making great salsa in the barrio and in the city and in the hood. Recently, back in Chicago, I was at a bookstore not far from my office looking for a book on leadership, and I happened to pass by the section of uh, uh, cookbooks, and I was struck this time by the huge selection of Mexican and Puerto Rican and Latino Caribbean cookbooks that were on the shelves. I was about to walk away when I saw a cookbook entitled 50 Great Salsa Recipes, okay? And I had to take a closer look to see how in the world an author could come up with 50 really great recipes for salsa, you know? And so I was amazed at what I found. Every ingredient imaginable was in this book, and they were combined to make everything from what they called screaming hot salsa, you know, which I was excited about, and tropical salsa, you know, which I didn't, I'd never tasted before, you know. And I was particularly in interested in this book because in the many years of teaching and, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, helping churches to think about the role of the church in the world and in the hood and how we're called to live and serve, I have often used the analogy that when a church is really effectively making a difference in the community, that maybe the best way to describe it for me, coming out of my context, is to, is to say it's like a church making great salsa. As we put into practice certain biblical mandates and principles and ingredients that are found in the Word, and we live them out, those ingredients are present, the results are fantastic, like great salsa. I don't know about you, but if you have a Mexican mama and she makes that salsa, I'll tell you, you don't know everything that goes in it, but she put the right ingredients in there, right? And it's uh, in Spanish, sabroso, right? It's, it's tasty, it's wonderful. Well, let me tell you, the best recipe that I found to help the church think about its responsibility to engage in community uh, transformation is found in the Gospel of Luke at the end of chapter 4 and chapter 5. And I'd like to briefly highlight the six essential ingredients that must be present for the church to truly make great salsa for the glory of God, or for the church to truly make uh, an impact in the community, okay? I'm going to see if I can figure this out. The church that is impacting the hood has these six ingredients present in their ministries. Okay, number one, as I said, Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. This is the, this is the principle that we're going to look at. That for a church to make great salsa in the, in the hood, we've got to embrace Jesus' mission to serve and love the poor and the needy as our own mission. Okay? That's important that if we're going to really make a difference, we've got to embrace Jesus' mission to serve and love the poor as our mission. Listen to what the Word of God says 
in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has appointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the downtrodden will be freed from the oppressors, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. In these words, Jesus declares his mission to preach good news to the poor and to set the captives free and to focus uh, his ministry and his energy and those three years that he was going to be on earth. Yes, he was heading ultimately to the cross, but as he comes out and begins his public ministry, the very first thing he says, you know where my focus is? You know what the focus of my mission is? It's on making sure that those that are most marginalized in society, those that nobody else thinks that they have anything to offer, those that seem bankrupt and empty and captive and downtrodden and oppressed, those are the ones that I have especially come to change and transform. The only way we will ever have a significant impact in the barrios and the neighborhoods and the hood is if we intentionally begin to declare and understand that our mission priority must be the same mission priority as that of Jesus. We need to embrace Christ's own mission as our mission. See, if we don't do that, and if we believe that it's something peripheral, something on the side, not central, we will never truly make the kind of impact that I believe God has called us to make. Now, I want you to, I mean, to me, it's so simple. As I began to reflect and think on this dynamic passage, profound passage, if we are called Christians, followers of Christ, doesn't it make sense that we follow the very mission of Christ himself? that we be the people of God that go out and meet the same needs and focus our ministry in the same way to the poor that Jesus focused on himself. And here's one of the things that I've come to conclude. You know, I planted a church in the inner city of Chicago, CCDA, ministries from all over the country are here who are living right in urban communities trying to make a difference there. But also, uh, and thankfully, there are many churches, you know, that are more out in the suburbs or they may not be located especially in the center of poverty or some like Lake that is right on the edge of this incredibly diverse urban community with incredible needs. Here's what I believe this passage pushes us to consider. That no matter where you are located as the body of Christ, that we must find a way to make Jesus' priority to, to, to the poor our own priority. Now, what Lake does and what La Vita does and what Lawndale does and what all these ministries that are located right in the heart of the city, see, our, our calling will be different. It will look different. We'll have to deal with it different. But the issue is, is the mission of saying, I am intentionally involved as a church. We're intentionally involved as God's people to touch the needs of the poor. Is that our mission? Do we understand that is not something extra, but is something that is at the core of Jesus' mission? So number one, the church that's really going to make an impact, we've embraced the mission of Jesus as, uh, to serve the poor as our own mission. The second uh, ingredient that's present is that the church that's truly going to make an impact in the hood will enlist and equip teams of men and women to accomplish this mission of caring and ministering to the needy and the poor in our community. Now, if you look at uh, uh, Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, it's this great passage that I love, and it's the story of Jesus calling the first disciples, okay? And, and here's what we find. We find Jesus encountering this group of businessmen who have a fishing business, and this is the first thing that Jesus notices. He sees an empty boat, okay? And, and this uh, 1 through 11 uh, describes the story very familiar to you, and you know what he does? Jesus invites these businessmen, these fishermen, to come and follow him. Drop everything, call, come and follow him. And he says to them, you know what? You have a passion for business right now, but I want to replace that passion for business with even a greater calling. I want to replace it with a new vocation of loving and serving the people that I have been called to love and serve in this world. Now, interesting. Jesus just declares his mission, and then he starts calling and collecting a team of people to walk with him for what? Now, he, 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 of course, there's many things, but one of the things that we neglect in the church is to understand that 
Jesus begins to collect a team of men and women to begin walking with him to help him accomplish the mission of reaching and ministering to the poor. And we see this throughout his ministry. And I just love this little passage when he looks at Peter and he says, Peter, you may not believe this. You may not, you don't understand what I'm about to tell you, but I tell you, years from now, you're going to know exactly what I'm saying. He said, you know what, Peter, right now, you've got this great passion for your business. You work late. You've been dreaming of retiring, you know, to the Bahamas or whatever, you know. You've got this great deal. You're working hard. You're saving up. You've got it all together. But you know what, there's a, uh, you know, when I looked at that empty boat that I saw, maybe it's an image of your life in reality. See, things will never give you satisfaction. Materialism will never give you meaning in life. And Jesus looks straight into the eyes of Peter and he says, listen, don't be afraid. Come follow me from now on. You'll be working to catch people. What kind of people is Jesus talking about? You know, I believe God cares for everybody. But one of the saddest indictments on the church today is that so much of our energy and our money and our resource is spent on reaching people who will give us something in return or who are just like us. Instead of taking serious the mission to go to the poor and saying, you know, that's who we're going to focus on. So Jesus, as he begins to recruit this team, I want you to think about this, that he's recruiting a group of men and women to come and to help him accomplish his mission to minister to the poor. Now, here's one of the things that I've come to learn in 20 years plus of urban ministry, that the task is too great the, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the difficulties and the challenges are too great for any one person or ministry to do it alone. And that's why we go in teams, and that's why we go with others, and we link hands with other partners and other churches and other organizations and even the city. Anybody who's willing to come and help us to accomplish this mission, we go with a particular purpose to do it for, in the name and, and for the glory of God. But we understand that this task is so great that we'll never be able to accomplish it ourselves. So number one, we, we have this mission that's the same as Jesus, to minister the poor, but then the church that's really going to make a difference. You will spend an incredible amount of time and energy figuring out how to train, how to mobilize, how to enlist, and how to empower and send out teams of people to serve the poor. Isn't that great that you don't have to do it alone, that we don't have to do it alone? that we can go out in teams to do this together. And the same results that Jesus had, I believe, that we can uh, also experience as we focus on the poor. Number th three is the church that's truly going to make a difference in the Vario exercises compassion that touches the lives of the needy in a personal manner. Okay? Luke chapter, five, uh, Luke chapter 5, verses 12 to 16, is the story of the leper, okay? It's, you know the story. It's one of the greatest examples of Jesus' love and compassion. See, Jesus is approached by a man whose life, whose life has been devastated by leprosy. This man throws himself at the feet of Jesus and asks, listen to what he asks, if you're willing, you can make me well. Jesus responds that he is very willing to meet his deepest needs. And then along with the miracle of healing the man of leprosy, Jesus does the unthinkable and he reaches out his hand and touches him. You see, how long had it been since this man had experienced personal touch? See, it may have been forever that, it, you know, that nobody would touch him. Jesus reached out and touched the man. I want to heal you. Be healed. And instantly the man's leprosy disappeared. See, I believe that what the urban community, what the city needs, what the hood needs, is not more programs. See, you know what they need? We need more ministry. We need more people filled with compassion that will go out in teams with, uh, uh, equipped with the mission of Jesus to reach the poor, and as they go out, you know what they do? They just touch people's lives. See, how many of you ever experienced walking down the street and you see somebody that you don't feel quite comfortable with, it may be a homeless person, it may be a gang member, it may be somebody, you know, that you're just not quite sure about. And, you know, what we would say the smart thing to do is sometimes walk and cross the road to go to the other side to avoid that potential conflict. But I tell you something, friends. What we see in Jesus is a, is a man who reached out to the needs of the poor and, and when this leper comes to him, he must have seen something in Jesus that made him know that he was, a, uh, uh, he was uh, somebody that was accessible. 
that he could come close to him. And along with the miracle of, of being released from leprosy, I, I want to say it again, maybe the greatest miracle was the fact that Jesus did it by touching him. You know what, friends? Uh, a good friend of mine that's a part of CCD on the board, Bob Lupton, says, you know what? The neighborhood doesn't need any more programs. They just need better neighbors who are willing to serve and to love and to reach out and touch in a personal way. People who are trying to survive the stigma of poverty do not need another program. They need caring individuals to reach out and touch them with the compassion, the care, and the love of Jesus Christ. Now think about this. If every church in America were to begin to do this one simple thing, to begin taking seriously the call to touch and to reach out in a personal way and minister to people, love on people, our cities would be transformed. Because along with the touch, we would begin to just know that, man, these are people that God truly loves. And let me say this, uh, and I hope you believe this. There is nobody that is untouchable to Jesus. Do you know that? That uh, aren't you glad? Because I don't know about you, but I felt like an untouchable in my life, you know? I felt like I was not worthy. Grew up, you know, child of migrant workers and kind of poor and not, you know, I learned to speak Spanish when I, uh, English when I was in first grade. You know, I worked hard to lose that accent, you know. And, uh, and then I, I'm working hard to keep my Spanish as well. But see, God sees everybody as somebody worth loving and touching. And so the church that's truly going to make a difference in their community and the hood, they understand that they've got to exercise compassion and touch the lives of people in a personal way. The fourth ingredient that we want to look at this morning is that the church that is really going to make an impact in the hood encourage, will encourage creative ministry efforts focused on ministering to the needs of the poor in the community. See, the church that is really going to make a difference, they're going to totally encourage creativity, okay, Create creative risk-taking to go out and minister to the needs of the poor. Now, the passage here is Luke chapter 5, 17 to 26. Again, an incredible passage that you know and you've heard and you looked at. Those four guys that come, you know, trying to get uh, their friend into the presence of Jesus. They get to the house. They knock on the door. You know, all the VIPs are inside. All the ones that got there, all the ones that knew what time the service was, you know, and where to go. They got there on time. But when these four men come, they knock at the door. There's no room. And nobody inside is going to give up their place so that the one outside can get inside. Okay, you know what I'm talking about? He's stuck on the outside. But these four guys, you know, many people think they must have been young guys because some of us old guys probably couldn't carry that paralytic guy up, up, up on that roof, right? But so here he goes, and these men take up this uh, guy who's on that pallet, and they lower him down in the presence of Jesus. What a creative way to do ministry. What a creative way. You know what is driven by? Compassion. Their understanding that this man needed what only Jesus could provide. Isn't that the reality that we live in today? That the poor and the needy, see, they don't need more programs. We already said that. They need more than what the world has to offer. And the church is the only institution that is able to give them not only, uh, you know, uh, heal bodies and, 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 and give people uh, a sense of dignity, but also help them encounter the God that can forgive all of their sins and help them be transformed on the inside. And that's what happens in this passage. And listen to what Jesus says in response to this. He says, four men arrived carrying a paralytic on a mat, and they, uh, they couldn't get to Jesus through the crowd, so they uh, dug through the uh, clay roof above the, their heads, and then they uh, uh, lowered the sick man on his mat right in front of him and Jesus looks up and you know what he says your faith is incredible your faith is incredible you know what I want to tell you this morning Jesus loves it when we are creative and do crazy things to help the neediest people in our society encounter his love and his care and ultimately his salvation you know, I, I, I think that one of the greatest uh, needs and roles of leadership in the church today is just to kind of say, listen, 
Go out and do it, man. You know, what are you going to do about it has been our theme. What can we do? Now, who has an idea, and how is it going to be, and how are you going to do it? We're going to encourage you. We're going to train you. We're going to make sure that we have the resource because somebody had to calculate how to get up the ladder. Somebody had to know which tiles to take off, and then somebody at the end of this whole thing had to figure out, you know, how are we going to put the roof back together again or pay for it, you know? And so all that is necessary, but listen, let's not let obstacles or whatever get in the way of thinking creatively to truly allowing the needy to encounter Jesus. What an incredible picture, you know, that uh, uh, all of these folks all around us are, are, are just full of despair and are paralyzed by their lives. See, that's a good picture of poverty, isn't it? Being paralyzed and not really being able to know how to get out of that situation. But Jesus has a way of not only healing you know, our lives here on earth, but then, you know, transforming our hearts. When people experience uh, folks loving them this much, it's natural for them to truly have their lives uh, transformed in a holistic way. And in this passage, I love it. You know what Jesus said? I'm going to forgive your sins, but I'm going to heal you of being paralyzed. See, there is no division between the proclamation and the demonstration. They're both demonstrated together. The fifth ingredient that we want to look at today is that we, as a church that's truly going to make an impact in the hood, must uh, expect challenges and criticism uh, for their commitment to serve the needy and the poor. Okay? Uh, Levi must have been blown away that Jesus would come to his house to meet his friends. See, the only people that had a major problem with that, you know who it was? It was the religious elite who saw Jesus as a threat to their spiritual authority and who long ago had confused a fanatical commitment to their religion for a real passion for God and people. Jesus knew how little they truly cared for the needs of lost men and women, and he made it clear that the sick are the ones who need a doctor. See, it's the sick. Listen to uh, Luke chapter 5, 27 through 32. Chapter 5, verses 27 through 32. It says this, Uh, later, as Jesus left town, he saw a tax collector. He came into his house, and in verse 31, it says, Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call sinners to turn from their sins, not to spend my time with those who think they are already good enough. That's what the New Living Translation says. Okay? So isn't it amazing that when we begin to take Jesus' mission seriously, to go out and touch the needs of the poor, when we deploy teams, when we start going out and doing all kinds of creative stuff, touching the lives of people in a compassionate way, it is not unusual, friends, for us to have to endure criticism and challenges as we begin to do this, you know? Uh, whether it's from inside the church or outside, you know, people begin to question. Here's one of the great uh, challenges that a, a church like Lake might face. You know, they might say, listen, you know, uh, all your people are not, you know, from the hood. All your people aren't necessarily living in poverty. What right do you have to be involved with the poor? You know what we say? We're following the mandate of Jesus. See, because we know that in reality, we are spiritually poor. And we're learning and we're being challenged to continually live our lives with purpose. And to live in such a way that we will partner to really touch the needs of the poorest people around us. And so, you know, when we take this mission seriously, expect challenges, expect criticism, expect that it's not going to be easy. Here's, you know, another challenge that we'll face is, man, where are we going to get the money, you know? Where's, where's the funding? We have so many other needs. How are we possibly going to start meeting the needs of so many homeless people and so many housing issues and so many medical needs and all of this stuff? Well, I'll tell you something. Just like Jesus encountered criticism and challenges, you know, people should have been rejoicing that he was hanging out with all these, you know, low-life people, you know? Folks that everybody else thought were low-life, they didn't have any value, but Jesus said, you know what, no. Again, in my economy... I created them. They're not low life to me. I love them. But expect challenges and criticism as we begin to do this. Finally, the sixth ingredient that I want to talk to you about today is that uh, we must, the church that's truly going to make a difference in the hood must evaluate the impact 
and uh, implement necessary changes in order to minister to the poor and needy effectively. Okay? Here's one of the things that I, I believe is essential. Jesus makes a profound statement about resistance, resistance to change. Even when change is positive and good, in, in Luke chapter 5, verses 37 to 39, I want you to look at this really quickly. Listen to what he says. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. The new wine would burst the old skins, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine must be put into new wineskins. But no one who drinks the old wine seems to want the fresh and new. And listen to this. The old is better, they say. Okay? Uh, do, do not put new wine into old wineskins is what Jesus said. Incredibly, Jesus knew that old structures and ways of doing things, not always, but often get in the way of authentic ministry that changes lives. And like the religious leaders who could not get past the fact that Jesus was hanging out with the poor and the downcast and the dregs of society and not adhering to the letter of the Jewish law the way they understood it, okay, in every situation. See, sometimes the church has a hard time and trouble with containing, uh, continuing genuine efforts to minister to the poor. See, sometimes we are so inflexible we are so used to having things our way. We have our structures in place. We have our ministries in place. We have our, uh, you know, our order in place. We have our preferences in place. And we find out that we, when we begin to take as a priority this commitment to minister to the poor, to really make it happen, to say, man, we got to make a difference because God cares about this. Because this is something that's on the heart of God. We realize that, you know what, one of the greatest challenges and one of the greatest needs and also one of the most exciting things that we can enter into is this process of change and transition to say okay you know what we don't worship structures we worship a living God who is able to help us to make sure that we do whatever it takes to minister to the poor often we invest most of our energy and resource into ministering to ourselves and are not set up to effectively reach out to those outside of the religious circles. Jesus exhorts us that we must be willing to change if we're to experience the pouring out of his spirit and, you know, if we're going to really be available to him to do the kind of things that he wants us to do. Listen, I know the change is hard. I know it's difficult, not only for, you know, uh, suburban churches or, you know, large uh, churches. It's hard for small churches, you know, because one, one thing that happens in the inner city is that we begin to feel like family, you know. You find a place of belonging, and you, all of a sudden, uh, people that have never had leadership before are elders and pastors and deacons, and they are heads of ministries. And the thought of reaching out and having other people come in and take their position is a threat as well. See, so all of us have this challenge, but Jesus makes it clear. See, it's difficult to put new wine into old wineskins, and we're challenged that sometimes we must create new structures if we're going to be able to contain the new work that God wants to do amongst the poor. Well, a number of years ago, when I was pastoring uh, La Vita Community Church, I made some holiday salsa to take to a church potluck that we were having, you know, around Christmas time. And I was really excited. I wanted to do something really special. So I found this recipe in, you know, one of these books, like, you know, uh, I, I don't think it was Martha Stewart or something, but, you know, uh, uh, you know, she wasn't around back then. But I found this book, and uh, it had this recipe for holiday salsa. But it was not the usual recipe that we uh, usually use in the Mexican community. It called for cranberries, for pineapples, for nuts, and some other ingredients, you know, that were very unusual. And, uh, you know, after a while, I, you know, I started making this. I said, okay, you know, I'm going to risk. I'm going to try it. So I make this salsa, put it all together, and I take it to the church, and I put it right there in the front where people can't miss it, you know, right next to the chips. And uh, I started noticing something. Nobody was trying my holiday salsa. They kind of would walk by it and look at it, you know, and they just didn't know exactly what to think. And so finally, one of my very good friends, the first guy that came to know Christ in our ministry back in those days, and this guy, you know, had suffered with alcoholism, and we helped him kind of get through that, and he met the Lord, and he was involved very heavily in our ministry, and he comes and looks at me, and he saw this look of depression on my face because no one was trying my salsa. 
So he kind of gets up the courage to go, and he takes a bite, you know, right in front of me. And he takes a bite, and he comes back, walks back to me, puts his arm around me, and he says, Pastor, you know, no puedes hacer salsa sin los tomates. He says, Pastor, you can't make real salsa without tomatoes, you know. <laughs> And so, you know, uh, my, uh, my, my Mexican friend came and said to me what I believe that I'm really saying to you as a church today and to the church all across America, that we cannot truly make great salsa in the hood, in the barrios of our nation, in the cities of our world, if we don't take seriously Jesus' recipe found in Luke chapter 4 and 5 for making great salsa in the hood. And, and I believe that, uh, you know, uh, today, salsa is the number one condiment sold in the United States of America. You know what I believe? That the church can one day rise up and make serving the poor like Jesus did the number one priority of the church. Wouldn't that be awesome? My prayer is that we would see churches all over our nation, that we would see Lake Avenue uh, Church continue to do everything they can to make great salsa for the glory of God. God bless you. Let me pray for us real quick. Father in heaven, I know there are many people in this uh, sanctuary today that are here because somebody went out and reached out to them and touched them in a personal way. And their lives have never been the same since then. This morning, God, uh, I pray that what people noticed was central and common to every story I shared and every passage I shared was that the center was Jesus Christ. And this morning, I just want to say to you, if you're here and you just long to have a relationship with a God that cares for everybody, who says there are no nobodies in my eyes, maybe you've been feeling like, you know, uh, I'm not sure if I really want to be religious. I want to encourage you to continue with that thought and say, no, I don't want you to be religious. I want you to reach out to this Jesus who demonstrates clearly that he loves and he cares for every single person in this world. Father, we love you. We want to reach out to you. And we want to invite you to help us to become a church that learns to make great salsa in the cities, in the neighborhoods, in the communities of our nation and our world for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.